Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Denise Connell, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Community Relations at Mercy. And uh, I want to let you know that part of Mercy's mission is to improve the health of the community. And one way that we can do that is by putting on programs like this on, on joint replacement this morning. Today we want to offer you another opportunity to uh, take care of your health, and that is we're offering a free personal wellness profile. This is what it looks like. There are copies on the table at the back of the room. And if you're interested, please take one with you today. It's a confidential questionnaire that you can fill out at home, mail it back to Mercy in the envelope that's provided, and we will uh, send you back a, a wellness profile that points out uh, health risks that you might have in areas where uh, you might improve your own health. A couple of other things I want to mention today are that you may have noticed that City Channel 4 is recording our program for later use on Channel 4, and I want to thank them very much for being here. Also, I want to mention parking. We're offering free parking today. The attendant in the booth outside knows that we're putting on this program, and just tell her that you were at this morning's program and your parking will be free. And don't worry about, we're not going to stamp the tickets or anything. Just tell her that you were at this morning's program. Uh, we will hold our uh, door prize drawings at the end of the program. And Dr. Scott also wants to allow lots of times for questions. So I will just tell you briefly that Dr. Christopher Scott is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he's been a member of the Steinler Orthopedic Clinic and a member of Mercy's medical staff since 2006, and we are very happy to have him here this morning. And Dr. Scott is going to tell you a little bit more about himself before his presentation, so uh, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Denise. Let's get this arranged. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. If you can hear me, anybody can hear me. Um, my name's Chris Scott. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was born and raised here in Iowa City, um, way over on the west side of town when there were cornfields there. Um, then moved away for a little while, but ended up coming back uh, after practicing in Mason City for about uh, nine years. And then the opportunity came back to my hometown, which I seized the moment and came back. I've had an interest in joint replacement for that may be better. I've had an interest in joint replacement ever since I started training in orthopedic surgery up in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, which seems like uh, about 21 years ago, I guess. And orthopedic surgery are the people who do joint replacement. They're the people that have a five-year residency after four years in medical school to learn how to do orthopedic surgery, which uh, joint replacement is a large part of now. It's becoming an increasing part of orthopedic surgery as it's become an increasing part of healthcare in America. If we look at joint replacements in America, there have been uh, an increasing number done. For the last probably 10 years, we've seen a 70% increase in joint replacements, hip and knee replacements in America. Uh, we're now pushing approximately 1 million hip and knee replacements per year in America. It's a very common procedure now. However, it's a big decision to have a joint replacement. It's not like changing the tire in the car. It's a much more involved process. There are significant risks to the procedure. Everybody's heard of a complication or a bad story with it, and it makes you concerned to make decisions by that. And hopefully I can give you information today that will help you, in your own mind, decide when would a joint replacement be right for you or to consider it. The most important thing to understand is it takes a large team of people to do joint replacements. Uh, I don't do it by myself. I don't do it uh, without several institutions and large numbers of highly trained professionals helping me. Um, but if it comes to talking about the ins and outs of the surgery, the risks and benefits, the uh, recovery times, the indications, when is the right time, then I think the orthopedic surgeon is a good contact point for you. Obviously, starting with your family doctor is the first step for many people. In some insurances, you'd be required to get a referral to an orthopedic surgeon. At Steinler, we don't require referrals, but depending on your insurance company, you may want to check with them before you make your own appointment because it can be to your advantage to go through your primary care model. And the government changes those rules every three to six months, so it'd be impossible for any of us to keep track without asking. Um, but your primary care physician is a good resource for sore knees, sore hips, sore shoulders, 
a bad ankle because these are all joints that can be replaced. Most people have heard of hip and knee replacements and they're by far the most common that are done. But more and more we're doing shoulder replacements and we're getting very good results with those and have been for many years. And shoulder replacements are a very good operation for somebody with a lot of shoulder pain. Ankle replacements I'll mention in passing because they're much less common, but again, for the right patient with the right condition, they can be very successful at alleviating pain and improving function. And that's really what it comes down to with joint replacement. We want to improve your pain. We want to improve your function. And so those are the questions that you should be asking yourself if you're thinking about joint replacement. How does this pain affect me? How am I functionally not getting around? I have thousands of stories about how that's affected people because that's what my patient's chief complaint is when they come in. I can't go to my grandson's football game. I can't get into the bleachers. I can't get down the stairs to the laundry. I can't get out of a low chair anymore. Those are all functional problems. It's not the pain that's stopping them from doing it, although it's certainly contributing to it, but it's function also. Fortunately or unfortunately, I live in Iowa where people are just a little bit tougher than some other states in America, I believe. And so they won't always come in because they're hurting so bad they can't live with it. And their complaint will be, I can't walk or I can't get up a stair. And you watch them walk and it, it hurts to see them walk because it appears painful, but they may not have pain. And judging pain is very difficult. Everybody's pain is different. Those of you who have had babies realize that when that happened, the pain threshold probably changed. When I had my neck fused, my pain threshold changed. You learn from experience what pain really is. And if you live with a pain like an arthritic hip, where it hurts in your groin and just keeps getting worse, or an arthritic knee where you're just kind of scared to step on it in the morning because you're not sure if it's going to hold you, uh, then you learn to deal with pain. You have to. That's how we survive. And so you can't just focus on the pain when you think about joint replacement. You also have to think about the function because both of those are things that we can improve with joint replacement. And so pain and function are kind of our main words we think about when we look to replace a joint. Now, function is important to understand. If functionally we want to run 10 miles a day or play basketball or um, competitively downhill ski, no, that's not a function that we can reliably improve with joint replacement surgery. We are not good enough and we have not developed good enough operations or prosthesis to make you 18 again. We cannot take your joint and make you that good. And, and most people realize that, but I just want to say it out loud, that's not what we're able to accomplish for folks. And if we see people try to go do that, we're usually in trouble because the, the prostheses, the parts that we put in, they're really not designed for that kind of work. And so functionally, activities of daily living is the term we use. You got to be able to get in and out of bed, get in and out of a chair, go for a walk. And these functions are critical for two things. One, living your life. Two, keeping your health up. If you're not active, if you're not moving, your weight's going to suffer your heart, your lungs are going to suffer, your blood sugar control is going to suffer, your cholesterol is going to suffer, all the things that your doctors harp on you about taking care of are going to suffer with a diminished activity level. And so again, it's that function of being able to get around and burn calories and get some regular exercise that's good for your body, it's good for your mind, it's good for your muscles and strength, and it's really essential. You don't want to have a joint replacement because I've put on some weight. I should fix my sore knee because then I'll lose some weight. If we look at people who have a joint replacement and we weigh them for years, which I, I used to do a long time ago for about 10 years, everybody got weighed and got weighed for years. If you, if you weigh somebody five years after their knee or hip replacement, their average weight has changed a total of two pounds, plus or minus. So it really doesn't change much. Now, if you break down that data and you look at what really happens, there are a group of people who do change their lifestyle. They change how they eat, they exercise more regularly, and they take off 20, 30, 40, 60 pounds. I've seen 120 pounds that somebody took off doing that, and it took her about four years, and I didn't recognize her. Um, but it, it, it can be done. But the joint replacement itself, improving the pain and improving the function, won't do it alone. And so that's not an indication to do it. It can be part of a solution to get you more active, to get you moving better, to take care of yourself better. But that surgery in and of itself won't get it done. If we talk about pain in joint replacement, again, there's a lot of things to do before we jump to surgery. And so sore knee does not equal knee replacement. I'm sure there's places in America where you can walk in with your sore knee and they'll sign you up for your knee replacement, but you really should not 
approach it that way. My advice would be to say, you know what, that surgery is kind of my last choice. So when is joint replacement really right? When your pain's bad, when your function's bad, and when you've tried the other things that may work. And the other things that may work are pretty simple. There's medications that are available over the counter. There is no free lunch with medications. Any medication you take can have a side effect. Those side effects can be severe. Just look at any 10 minutes on TV and any medicine they're advertising, and there'll be probably two in that 10 minutes. We'll have that rapid speak. You know how to understand when they tell you everything could go wrong, including death. So you've got to be careful with those medications. But the medicines like Tylenol and ibuprofen and Aleve that are out there, they could all hurt you. I've seen it happen uh, many times, but they can also help you a lot. And that's something you need to discuss with your orthopedic surgeon or your physician or your nurse practitioner or your PA or your pharmacist and get the information on what to watch for and try medications like that in safe doses. And don't think that more is better. That's not a good idea with anything in life, especially medication. If medications aren't really helping it, we have other tricks we can do. We do injections of medications into joints, uh, steroids, things like visco-supplementation, which are fancy words for slippery stuff we put in knees to help with pain. And these can be helpful. They don't fix your underlying joint function. Uh, they don't fix the arthritis, but they can settle it down, cover up the inflammation, and buy you time. And a lot of times that's important because knee arthritis or hip arthritis especially, they don't just get bad and get worse and get worse and get worse. They run through a course. I mean, the last week in Iowa, holy cow, with those lows coming through and the weather and it's 60 and it's 30, that'll make your joints hurt. And it's the humidity and the temperature fluctuations, and it's not an old wives tale, I'll tell you. It affects your joints and it's going to make them hurt more. And, and that's what arthritis does to you. And the arthritis will have good days and bad days. And what you have to try and map out as you think about it is, are my days that are bad getting so numerous and my good days so infrequent? Are I, am I getting to the point where I'm just waiting if I'm going to have a good day again? Then you start thinking about joint replacement. You're doing your conservative things. You've tried your medications. Maybe you've tried a shot for a particularly bad flare and it did or didn't help. And then, okay, my bad days are getting too numerous. My activities are getting too bad. My pain's getting to the point where I don't want to deal with it anymore. Now I'm considering joint replacement. Why do people have joint replacement? The main reason people have joint replacement is arthritis. Arthritis is a very broad term. Essentially, it just means inflammation of the joint. No, I'm not texting. I'm supposed to watch the time. Um, although it was tempting because my sons are texting me. Um, inflammation in the joint can come from many reasons. The most common reason is degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis. Essentially, that's the joint wearing out. It's a complex process we don't really understand, but the joint's main function is to move. Those moving surfaces have a cushion called articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is the end of the chicken drumstick, that nice white shiny surface there. It wears out with time, just like the tread on a tire would. The difference being your body can get inflammation, pain, swelling, stiffness, all associated with that wearing out process, and that's the arthritis in your knee. So the most common cause would be osteoarthritis. Other causes include lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, a host of what we call inflammatory arthritis, gout, etc., and then post-traumatic arthritis. You know, you tore a meniscus or a different kind of cartilage in your knee, that's a trauma. The doctor may have taken it out and helped it, but the knee still had trauma, and down the road we're at risk for more arthritis problems. A fracture, a bad bruise that someday can come home to rest and lead to arthritis, a ligament tear, uh, these, these uh, athletes you see with L ACL tears have high risk of arthritis down the road. And so these are all things that can lead to arthritis and wearing out of the joint that can eventually cause the pain and function problems we've been talking about. Um, it used to be back in the 70s when joint replacement was first starting that about two-thirds of the joint replacements we did were for osteoarthritis, and probably some of those were traumatic, and about one-third was inflammatory arthritis. Uh, currently, we're down to about 10% or less of the joint replacements are uh, inflammatory arthritis. That's because of the tremendous gains that have been made in the last 15 to 20 years treating inflammatory arthritis. And so if you do suffer from conditions like that, you're much less likely to have to deal with a guy like me doing a joint replacement than you were many years ago. 
and it's becoming fairly rare for me to see people with inflammatory arthritis. So if you have one of those conditions, I really encourage you to talk to a rheumatologist who treats those kind of conditions with drugs that I don't even know some of the names of them. When they come in, I have to go look them up and read about them before surgery because it's revolutionized the treatment of that type of inflammatory arthritis. And they're very successful at um, preserving joints for folks and keeping them away from me. The, uh, the causes of arthritis will lead to the same end problem though. A worn out joint we don't treat necessarily with different types of procedures we're left with basic procedures, okay? And the basic procedures are called joint replacement. There are times when it's appropriate to do a lesser surgery in our arthritic joint, taking out a loose piece of bone floating around arthroscopically. Um, treating a torn labrum and a hip that's got a little arthritis may hold some gains. Again, we're not fixing the underlying arthritis with that problem, but we're cleaning out the joint and we're trying to buy it time. You want to be very careful having or doing surgeries like that. Because a joint that's worn out that we're going to clean out isn't going to fix the underlying problem. Think of realigning the tires on a car that's driving funny. If it's driving funny because the tires are worn off on one side, realigning it's not going to help. And so filling the air in those tires is not going to help also. We've got to fix the underlying problem, which is there's no tread on the tire. And that's essentially what a joint replacement is. A joint replacement resurfaces it. If we would have been really good marketers back in the 70s when joint replacement uh, um, was just becoming invented and done on a large scale, we would have called it a knee resurfacing or a knee retexturing or something really sexy like that. Because most people think of a knee replacement as, well, they take out a chunk of my knee and they put it on the shelf and then they get a new chunk and they put it in. We're not that good. We can't replace the tendons, the blood vessels, the nerves, the muscles. We, we can't do that. What we can do is we can very carefully and precisely remove the surfaces of the joint. So in the knee, that's the end of the thigh bone and the top of the shin bone and the back of the kneecap or the patella. And in the hip, that's the ball of the femur and the socket of the pelvis. Or in the shoulder, a similar ball and socket type of procedure. And we recover those with different substances. Typically, one side will be made of metal, and that metal will be very hard, so we can polish it very, very, very shiny, because a polished surface obviously wears less and is less likely to break. And we'll talk about different surfaces in a second. And then the other side will usually be something that tries not to wear much, because that hard metal, it can be smooth, but what do we put it against? And that's the biggest problem with joint replacements. The biggest problem is they're not perfect. They wear out just like our bodies do. And the wear itself is manageable, okay? We can make them thick enough or strong enough that they don't typically break or fall apart. But it's our body's response to those wear particles, which is the big take home message for those of you who have had a joint replacement or may have one in the future is, you gotta take care of it. And you gotta take care of it different than your own body. Because you may not feel your body's response to those particles. It's not something to worry about. It's not something to not have a joint replacement about but it's something to talk to your orthopedic surgeon about because every different substance that we use to wear has different risks and benefits associated with it. And so the tried and true, the thing that's been around since John Charlie in England invented hip replacement is a high molecular weight plastic, which is really cool because they also use it on grain elevators where they pour you know, millions of tons of corn over because it wears so good. They kind of stole it from orthopedics. So high molecular weight plastic and a hard shiny ball would be your primary well-known uh, hip replacement parts or a hard uh, metal end of your thigh bone or femoral component and a plastic liner on top of a metal tray in your knee would be the wear components. So the problems with plastic when it wears is in some people, not all, their bodies will really react to that small little tiny particles of plastic. And so you need to watch for pain and swelling and the knee getting loose, but then you need to get an x-ray every couple of years. And you know they're gonna change the recommendations of how often to do that, but I'm not gonna say do it every year, or do it every two years. Listen to your doctor, come back when they tell you to, because different joints will need to be followed differently. But those particles can cause bone loss, and left untreated, you can lose a lot of bone around a joint replacement, and that's a very prob difficult problem to fix, because remember, these parts are attached to your bone. And so the plastic particles can cause wear, if you ever turn on the television or read a magazine, you've heard about metal on metal hip replacements. Metal on metal hip replacements were designed specifically to try and avoid that plastic wear problem. We know that in young patients, if we do a joint replacement and they're gonna live a long time, they're gonna have more wear, they could lose more bone. 
What's the solution? Find something that wears less. A lot of research, a lot of technology improvements. We try a metal bearing ball on a metal shell. And for some people, those function great and do well in the long term. Unfortunately, there is no free lunch with joint replacement, just like with medication. There's always going to be a risk of complications. The metal ions, or debris from the wear of that, can also cause problems. They cause a different soft tissue reaction, our body's response to those particles, that can not only eat bone, it can also eat and replace, destroy soft tissue around the joint. And typically that's been used in hip replacements. And that's why it's important to follow any kind of hip, whether it's a metal on plastic or a metal on metal, because both can cause wear problems that necessitate treatment. The last substance I'll mention just because I'm kind of obsessive and complete, is the ceramic. Ceramic is a pretty good substance. It is very smooth and shiny. It's very hard. The only thing that makes you worried a little bit about it is, you know, when you drop that plate, it shatters into a million pieces. And that shattering of a ball and a hip replacement is what people have been concerned about because, although very rare, it has been described. And that's one of those problems you'd just rather not have where you jump down hard on something or step hard on something and it breaks. Currently, there's a pretty good track record because the industry for once got smart and said, you know what, we're going to have one company make them all, high quality control, keep close track of them, make sure there's not a problem. So in certain select people, I think a ceramic head on a plastic or potentially metal, although that would be not advisable, would be a very good wear surface for you. And again, the idea is that we can't eliminate wear or eliminate the need to follow these. It's trying to decrease the amount for you. Why do I go through all this? Because if you're talking about joint replacement and you're trying to make a decision about what's right for you, you gotta understand the different problems you're getting into, okay? And long-term wear is one of the problems you have to think about. So having a hip or a knee or a shoulder or an ankle replaced is not the end of the process. It's like I tell my patients, it's kinda like we're getting married and we can't get divorced or if you divorce me, you gotta get another doctor because you gotta follow them for life. You gotta keep an eye on it long-term. And, and that's important to do. I mean, those are the only really good reasons to come and see me in the office is because you have a well-functioning joint replacement and you're just supposed to get it checked and it looks good 99% of the time. And you go home with a good checkup and you do that every couple of years and that's really all you need. But that's an important thing to do. And if your physician's not following that long-term, then maybe you want to find a physician who's interested in taking care of all those problems long-term. So those are good questions to ask. All these different bearing surfaces are important issues now, and you kind of want to know what's in there because you want to understand what the different risks and benefits are for that, and they should be willing to discuss that with you. And, and people have different opinions, and if there was a right answer to do every time, obviously every doctor would do it the same way and it wouldn't be an issue, but that's not known. The other thing I'll talk about is the other direct-to-consumer marketing you'll see a lot, which is the new knee. You know, is it the circle knee? Is it the knee that bends and rotates? Is it the gender-specific knee? These companies are listed on the stock exchange. They do very well. They make a lot of money on joint replacements. They have nothing to do with me or other physicians that put them in. They used to be able to influence physicians fairly readily, but the government's cracked down on that, thankfully, very appropriately. And so now they're marketing to you. They're out telling you why you want this new knee. And it's Good in some ways, because it makes you aware of what's out there, that there is hip and knee replacements available that can ease your pain and improve your function. But it's bad in other ways, because they're not exactly real honest all the time. You know, if I have a knee replacement, I don't want the new one. I don't want the one that's been around a couple years and looks like it could be better. I want the one that's been around 20 years that 97% are still functioning well that were implanted in a large number of people. And that's hard data to get. In America, we don't keep track of that. The companies have not done it for obvious reasons. They might not be the one that's lasting the longest, so we won't ask the question. The doctors have not done a good job studying it. Those who have are usually employed by the company, and you wonder if you're going to hear the truth, honestly. When you read an article in medicine, you got to look to see who paid for the guy writing it, because if it was a company, the chance of you getting the complete truth, there's a conflict of interest. And so you've got to be careful with that data. Unfortunately, or fortunately, other countries are much better than us in America at doing that. So the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Finland, Sweden, very obsessive. They have a central government. They keep track of every surgery. If there's ever a redo surgery done, it goes on the books. So you really capture about 100% of the population and 100% of the surgeries done and have done it for many decades now. 
So we can look at that data and say, holy cow, in Australia they do, you know, probably the six most common knees here are very similar in uh, either Alaska, or I'm sorry, either in Canada or uh, Australia. However, they actually have the data to tell us how they survive by part, by person, by age, and that's very useful data when you're saying, doctor, how long will my joint last? Well, I can't tell you in Americans, but American and Australians are not too far apart. Although we're probably bigger, uh, it's pretty close. Um, important things to talk about uh, when you are, or I'm sorry, important people to talk to when you're thinking about a joint replacement are your family, your friends, your regular doctor, and your orthopedic surgeon. Why are all these people important? Number one, you're going to be knocked down a little bit if you have a joint replacement. It's not like changing the tire in the car. The analogy works very limitedly. You're going to be laid up for a while. You're going to be slowed down. You're going to need a little help. It's not like you're in the hospital for a week. You're in the hospital two, three, four days on average. Um, we don't send people to home the same day here at Mercy and never will as long as I'm involved with it. You can have that done. I would caution you to ask around before you have that done. But you're going to need some help. You need somebody to drive for you for a while. In a knee replacement or a shoulder replacement, you'll typically need somebody to take you to therapy for a while. You're not going to feel 100% right away. These aren't quick fixes. It takes weeks and months to fully recover from one. Now, sure, we have people who have a knee replacement and they're out golfing in four to six weeks. But that's the top 5%. You know, the slowest 5% may be taking six months before they went back and golf, assuming they were functioning at that level. You have people that say, well, when can I go to work? Well, are you working part-time at a bank sitting down? Or are you working full-time, 12-hour shifts on a factory line moving boxes that weigh 10 pounds? Obviously, those are totally different questions. And those are the kind of questions you need to be talking to your family, your doctor, and your therapist, and your boss about because they need to understand time-wise what it's going to take to get you back. It's important to talk to your family for another big reason. I cannot tell you how many times the wife or the husband has brought the spouse in to sit down to talk to the doctor about their knee. And the reason is, and I've been, I've been guilty of this myself, is when you're hurting all the time and you're getting slowed down from the things you like, you become slightly less fun to be around and slightly more irritable, apparently, I've heard. And so when you get to that point, you've got to start to listen to your spouse saying, well, why do I have to? I mean, I know I limp, but it doesn't really hurt. Well, yeah, but you won't go for a walk for me, and you won't go to the kids' games, and you won't go to the church picnic, and you, won't, you just won't, won't, won't. And what you're doing is you're unconsciously avoiding these things that you know are going to bother your knee or bother your hip. And so hearing from other people what they see you not doing and how it's changing you is sometimes important for you to help make the decision that maybe you should get something done to help you. And it, it, it sometimes takes that to break the ice to say, okay, what are the options? Coming to the doctor to talk about a joint replacement should not be a fear of them telling me I might need surgery. You're going to decide if you need surgery. It's an elective operation. It's not something that you're going to die if you don't have it done. Now, it's very clear reading about Canada and Australia that if you are a candidate for joint replacement, you decide to have it done, that waiting a year or two or even greater than six months leads to a worse outcome because if you read their literature, it's all about how long you wait for your surgery because that's the reality of a socialized medicine system. Joint replacements are wait lists. It's all about the wait list because they're only going to spend so much of their resources on it. And those days are coming in America almost without doubt. However, that decision to move forward is still going to be yours. And you need to be involved in the process. You don't want to expect the doctor to say, you have a bad knee, you need to have it fixed because the doctor can't tell because I see x-rays that look horrible, terrible arthritis. The bones are worn into each other. Kind of makes me cringe to look at it. Kind of makes me happy too, because here's somebody I can probably make a good difference for. And they may not have hardly any symptoms. They're getting on and off the tractor. They're running through rough ground. They're sorting the hogs. Their knee gets a little sore now and again. They wanted to have it checked out because everybody says they're limping. Well, you know, if you're a 55-year-old farmer and that's your knee, you just keep working with it because I don't want you sorting hogs and jumping off the tractor for another 30 years with an artificial knee. If it doesn't hurt, he's functioning, he's not hurting, we don't have the indication for surgery, okay? But now he knows what he's got, he knows if it flares up what the other treatment options are, he could take some medicine, he could have a shot, and he knows that someday if it got so bad he didn't want to live with it, we could fix it. And so that's good information to have. But you can't tell how much it bothers you looking at an x-ray. You can tell a little bit how they walk, 
but you have to talk to people. So you need to get a history, you need to perform a physical examination, and the best way to do that is to see a physician for it. But don't be scared to go in and ask the question, because for them to tell you you need to have a joint replacement is, in my mind, inappropriate. They can recommend it as an option if you're an appropriate candidate, and you're gonna make that decision with you and your family. So the answer to today's question, and there will be a test later, I've been told, is how do you know when you're ready for a joint replacement? You'll know. It sounds trite. It doesn't sound like very good advice, but I'll give you the caveat that the man that I went to train with in Wisconsin, uh, Andrew Macbeth, who is the youngest member of the Hip Society, he was born with a congenitally bad hip. It was bad his whole life. He limped horribly, but it wasn't so bad. You know, he had a good orthopedic surgery career. He was a busy guy. He liked to cross country ski, and he disappeared my fourth year in residency for like six months. It was weird because nobody would talk about it. And then it became apparent that he either had some bad disease or he finally went and got his hip fixed. And it turned out he finally got his hip fixed. And he came down here to Iowa City to have it done, so I actually knew my spies told me what was going on. <laughs> and he showed back up, and we went to him and said, how, how could you not tell us? I mean, what happened? You know, What changed? And he said, I woke up one day, and I didn't want to go cross-country skiing, and I didn't even want to really go to work because my hip hurt so bad. And I realized now was the time for me. And here's a guy who spent his whole life studying it. He developed prosthesis. He's an extremely good orthopedic surgeon. He taught hundreds of surgeons how to do this. And he was a very good mentor. And he just woke up one day and he knew. And I hear that from people day after day and week after week and month after month. Like, why did you decide to do it now? We've been injecting it or talking about it for years. They just decide now's the time. And you'll come to that point too if, if you're thinking about it. So don't pressure yourself. But you talk to your friends who have had it done so you understand what you're getting into. You talk to your physicians so you understand the risks and benefits. You also need to talk to the primary care physician. You need to take care of yourself. You need to take care of your health. You don't want to say, oh, now that I've just had my heart attack, I better start taking care of myself. Now is the time to get my hip and knee replaced. No, that's not the right time to do it. You need to get your house in order medical-wise before you jump and do that. Because what we don't want is to find, oh, you had an abscess tooth infection risk higher for joints. Oh, by the way, I haven't been able to uh, urinate, uh, you know, except for maybe once every two days. You know, those problems should be addressed. You don't want to add one problem on top of another. A joint replacement is enough of a big deal that you need to have yourself in reasonably good order before you go do it. Obviously, if you're in great shape, you wouldn't have it done. It's slowing you down. Let me close, uh, and then I'll have some time for some questions, with uh, a little bit of information that I, I want to educate you a little bit about. In 2009, which is the last time that I can get real data from the government, the U.S. government, for people that were admitted to the hospital for a procedure, they spent $10.3 billion on total knee patients and $7 billion on total hip patients. Those were two of the highest four things that were done by the government. All right. In the na next um, 12 years, they anticipate we'll go from the 600 and some thousand total knees done in the U.S. each year to 3.5 million total knees a year. So if you extrapolate that, and I do my math, that'd be a $50 billion increase in government expenditure for knee replacements alone. That doesn't include anybody with private insurance, Wellmark, having a knee replacement, which is increasingly part of our population that we see because we take care of younger people with arthritis more. There's two big factors with this. Factor number one is, guess what? There's a lot of older people. The baby boomers are getting older. They're reaching the prime years to have their hips and knees wear out and they are hurting and they need help. So there's a, there's a very realistic reason. But the increases we've seen up until now, which have been even faster, are more related to the obesity epidemic. And I'm a victim. There's other victims here, but that extra weight we're carrying clearly contributes to the wearing out of our hips and knees. There's very clear evidence that we're wearing ourselves out faster carrying this extra weight. And it's, it's an unsustainable situation. There's no way we can afford to take care of all those things through the future. So what can you do? do what can you do to make a difference? You can watch your weight. It doesn't take 50 pounds to make a difference. If you have typical knee arthritis in its earlier or even advanced stages, it tends to make your knee bow out a little bit. Sometimes you're special and it bows in if it wears the other way. If you take off five pounds, between 15 and 20 pounds will be off that worn out part of your knee with every step you take. 
And I'll challenge you to pick up 20 pounds if your knee is sore and walk around with it for five minutes and see how much more it makes your knee hurt. Uh, a shopping bag or a laundry bag will make a big difference to you. So that few pounds difference you make, I have routinely seen people go away and stay away from me because they feel better if they can lose just a few pounds. So those are critical things you can do to take care of yourself with that. And then also be understanding that in countries where they have moved to rationing this, you're talking about one to six months to see the orthopedic surgeon and 150 to 300 days to have the operation. This is Australia, Canada, and certain regions. And and they're performing much fewer of them with smaller populations uh, than we are right now. So you want to remain engaged in the process. I, I haven't read Obamacare. I, I can't read that. I just have to try and respond and react to it. But increasingly, we find limitations and preauthorizations, most of which are very appropriate. We shouldn't be doing surgery that's not indicated, that's not safe for people. And so I applaud the government for, in some ways, rationing, okay, because we need to. It's not safe for some people. But you want a voice in that, and the only way you're going to have a voice in that is to stay informed. So I'd encourage you to stay up to date with what's happening legislatively. And if your insurance company tells you no, ask why. And if your doctor tells you no, ask why. Because unless we get an understanding of how they're changing the rules on us, we really don't have a way to react to it. I've told you a little bit about joint replacement this morning. Uh, I could talk about this for 10 hours. That's what I talk to people about every day for uh hours on end. But I want to leave time for questions. So if people have questions, I'd ask you to ask them and I'll repeat them for the TV camera and we'll see if we can get some more information for you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Do I do uh, the less invasive hip replacement and what is my opinion on it? Hip replacement has evolved vastly in 40 years. Every time we did a hip replacement in the 70s, you chopped off a piece of bone and then wired it back on to do the hip replacement. We're a long way from there. In the last 10 years, as the volume of orthopedic surgery has ramped up so much, you see a lot more talks like this designed to market to people like you. And one of the best ways to market to people is to tell them there's something new and better. And I addressed that a little bit when I talked about prosthesis selection. Do you really want the newest prosthesis? In my opinion, no, you want the tried and true. That's somewhat, what, that's somewhat true with a surgical approach. Um, every year I've done this job, I've gotten better at it. And the reason I've gotten better is I learn how to make a different incision, not always smaller, but different, that hurts you less, or heals better, or cut less tendon, or cut no tendon, or go from the front of the hip in certain cases, and go from the back of the hip in other cases, and disrupt the muscle less and put the parts in more perfectly, and put better parts in. And it's, it's such a complex interaction of all these things. My answer is, I go from the back of the hip, and I make a smaller incision. The reason to go from the front of the hip, in my mind, would be less dislocations. My dislocation rate is under a half percent for the last seven years since I've been here. I can't make that better. So I've got nothing to gain going from the front on dislocation. Show me the data that patients limp less with an anterior approach because most of the data indicates a bigger limp with an anterior approach. Show me that there's less blood loss or a quicker hospital discharge. That is not out there, okay? So if I could see some peer-reviewed data where we actually saw less pain or better function after hip replacement, I might change to do an anterior approach. But I don't have a good reason to do that right now because I, the advantages that it purports, I have not observed in patients who have had it done, nor have I seen it in peer-reviewed literature that would indicate there's actually some advantage to it. And I'm afraid it's a lot like the two incision hip that rose and fell in about a year and a half because it was a huge step backwards in terms of complications and problems. And there's probably six or 10 guys in the US who could do a two incision hip and it was great. And, you know, I can give you your names if you want to talk to them. But, you know, you're not going to find somebody doing a two incision hip well in this state, I'm pretty sure, unless there's a new guy out there I don't know about, and I know most of them. And I think the approach is a good discussion to have with your doctor. I don't do it. I can give you my 15-minute talk about why, but we don't have time. But I don't think it really offers an, an answer that makes you want to go learn it as an orthopedic surgeon. Yes, ma'am. How close are we to uh, growing cartilage? Yeah, they, they can grow cartilage. 
The trick is to get it to actually heal to the bone in the knee and stay there and be durable. So there are procedures that are done now. Dr. Misnick, my partner, does them uh, called De Novo, or there's a Genzyme, another product out there where they actually harvest cells from your body and then grow it, and then you take and make an incision, and you put the cells in there, and you put a patch over it, and there's some decent results with that. Those are for traumatic conditions and small focal defects in young kids, and they get okay results. For somebody who's worn out their joint, again, your alignment's changed, the substance of the fluid has changed, the underlying bone has changed. We haven't seen any good results with that. I'm aware of one clinical study. I had a patient go out to Boston where they were doing a clinical trial. He was rejected from enrolling in it, so I couldn't learn more about it. But it was, it was research. And I don't see us being on the edge of that. And briefly, the way that funding for basic science research and other research is being absolutely slashed in this country, I don't see us on the edge of anything like that for a while. And it, it's a, it would be a great answer, but I don't have a good answer for you. And, you know, if I was... I'm 47. If I had a bone-on-bone -bone knee, I would be trying to put it off because I'm too young to have that. You know? And eventually I'd have to do it, but I'd be trying to put it off just like I tell my young patients. But I don't hold much hope that we're going to be able to grow cartilage in my arthritic knee, if I had one, um, in my lifetime. And I could be wrong, but I read that literature pretty regularly. And there's a lot of test tube research that shows some information, but it's getting less as the funding goes away. And it's not attracting our best and brightest when you don't fund them and when there may be no future in it. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, what do you think uh, the role is for physical therapy and exercise, uh, maybe not so much in the hip as in a shoulder or something? Yeah. Uh, does, that, does that delay things or is it even help? Okay, so before surgery, I think it's great. If I look at my patients who do the best with joint replacement and I ask them, why did you do so well? I mean, you're really doing well. Why do you think you did well? Because I was in good shape beforehand. I did my exercises regularly and I kept doing them even longer than they wanted me to. And so they did the exercise ahead of time and they learned it from a therapist and they did it afterwards and they did it with a therapist and then they did it on their own because you can't spend all day with a therapist. And so I think it's a critical role for knees. I think it's a very big role for shoulders and I think it's critical for the hip but that's more mind trick training to protect the hip than it is actual exercises and things of that nature. So um, unfortunately now we're seeing insurance companies tell us that we have to do physical therapy before a joint replacement. And that's okay unless the, you have to do it six or eight weeks and then you don't have any benefit after you have your joint replaced. So it, it, it becomes a sticky situation. But yeah, as part of a conservative therapy program before surgery and as an integral part of the recovery from it, I think it's a critical part. I'll try and repeat it next time. Sorry. Yeah, Denise? Um, I see a lot of over-the-counter supplements for joint health mm -hmm. advertised. Do they have any value? Yeah. Are there value to over-the-counter supplements that we see advertised? Uh, the only one that shows, again, some data behind it is uh, glucosamine taken, I think it's 500 milligrams, at least two to three times a day. It's available at a very reasonable price generically, or you can pay a lot of money for it to get a fancy one mixed with other things. And I can't tell you that the other things, the chondroitin and the other, the other ingredients are necessarily good for you. It's generally well tolerated with low side effects, GI upset being the primary one. And if you give it in a sugar pill to 100 people, the people who got the glucosamine look better. That's the best way to tell from a study. So I think that it holds some value. People don't usually notice it helping and making them better unless they do it for a month or two. And then it's usually like, like they're normal. So I challenge them to stop it. And when they stop it, they go, oh yeah, it was helping. And they get back on it again. So I think it has a role. Um, and I think that it's relatively safe. And so if it's something you can afford, it's reasonable to give it a trial. Yes, sir. Yeah. Fish oil and yeah. So are there other over-the-counter preparations that I look to? Well, the Flexol was more in the topical rubs of Bengay or Flexol or uh, all sport. There's a bunch of different topical liniments is essentially what they are. And, and those are, uh, I guess they're medicines. Uh, I guess anything you put on your body is a medicine in some ways. A capation is a hot pepper that some people use for pain also. 
Uh, I think those can be beneficial for folks. I don't think they're as efficacious uh, as the medications and uh, as the exercise and weight loss that can be beneficial, but there's probably some role for them. Um, and again, low side effects from them. I will mention that there's also prescription medication, you know, an ibuprofen-like drug uh, called Voltaren, or even I believe may be available in this country now, which are anti-inflammatory medicines that you put on your skin. And those offer some advantage for people who have, uh, you know, GI side effects where they can't take those medications. So there are other topical things that can be useful that way, yes. Let's go back there. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there a limitation of how long you can receive steroid injections and do they scar <coughs> cause scar tissue? Um, they need to be spread out too frequently into one place will cause atrophy of soft tissues, potentially atrophy of bone. The reason we're giving the shot is because we don't want the side effect of the steroid in the whole body. Otherwise we'd give you oral steroid and the side effects from that are huge. You know, anybody taking steroids is trying to get off them usually. Um, what I believe is that as long as you spread it out by at least three months between an injection, as long as you're getting some efficacy, it's lasting for weeks to months when you have it done. I have people going, well, since before I got here, so way over 10 years, that have been getting shots two, three, maybe at most four times a year. In some of those cases, there is no other alternative. They have such medical comorbidities, there's no other choice, and so the, that's what we can do palliatively for care. For others, it's still working. They're still young. They're not in a hurry to go have a surgery at age 49 or 51, especially if they've got a very vigorous job. And so it's a cover up and we're covering it up. So I think if it's spread out appropriately and you're not seeing side effects, I don't worry about long term. I don't think there'd be any way it'd be causing scar tissue. Let's go over here sometime. Yes. So it, Right. So how long does a modern hip replacement last? So if I put in a hip replacement today uh, in somebody and I use an uncemented prosthesis, which is what I'd use for a young person, and I used an uncemented cup and I used the new high molecular weight radiated plastic, which is the best plastic we've had available ever that's been stored in a specific way too, because we learned how it was stored made a big difference. And I put in an appropriate size ball for that. I think that person's chance of that hip functioning well at 15 years is way over 90%, depending on how big they are and depending on what they do with it. If they weigh 350 pounds, it will wear much faster than if they wear 180 pounds. And if they are farming hogs or trying to run or something that I would advise against, I know it will wear faster also. But I see hips that had worse plastic with not as well designed prosthesis, all the time that are functioning well from the early 90s, uh, from the Steinler practice from Dr. Poole and Dr. Dykstra and guys that put them in a long time ago and are retired now. And so they can last that long. And so if we look out 15 years for a hip replacement, I think there's a, the odds are it's gonna be working good for you. And then what happens? It's not like they all fail. So if you look at how they fail, you lose some in the first year. There was a dislocation, there was an infection, there was another bad complication that you had to go do surgery for. And then it's a pretty flat curve for many years. A few loosen, very few. A few wear early, very few. A few people have reaction to the debris. And then when we get out at 10, 15 years, closer to 15 now, we see that the rate of survival starts to drop off. It's not like a cliff, but they start to fail more regularly. And usually it's because the bearing surface is starting to wear more rapidly. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm 83, and the knee started giving me problems several years ago. Huh. I'm on the cortisone shot in the knee. Uh, I'm trying to wait for the three months to come around. Yeah. Uh, they don't last as long as they did before. Yeah. Is there any danger for me continuing on with this and putting the decision off then for a replacement? Is there any danger to putting off joint replacement with cortisone shots in my early 80s? Your biggest risk of doing that is you're going to have some other medical problem come up that's going to take away the option to have your knee replaced if the shot doesn't work next time. That's your biggest risk, okay? So if your general health is excellent, you don't have other medical problems, then I don't think you're hurting yourself to put it off. But my question to you at 83 is, what are you waiting for? If it's not bad enough to replace it, don't do it, okay? But... 
you got an excellent chance that the knee replacement would last you a lifetime. If it's really slowing you down two months out of every three because the shot maybe works a month, then you got to say, all right, am I going to just live, live like this forever? Your risk in your 80s is no higher than the risk of 60s and 70-year-olds. Okay, if we look at all the people in Iowa who have a joint replacement, 60, 70, 80, same risk rate through there, okay? You know, if you have other medical conditions, that can increase your risk rate. But if you're 53, I'm telling you, yeah, ride the shots. Don't have your surgery. But at 83, you're not going to get healthier. The knee's likely going to last you a lifetime, even if your family all lives to 100. And I can tell you that last year I replaced five guys over the age of 90's knee, and their biggest complaint was, why the hell didn't I do this before? Because they've been doing what you've been doing for 10 more years, finally going, oh, I just, I'm not gonna be able to stay in my house anymore if I don't fix this. Now they're back in their house, kinda happy they did it and frustrated they've been suffering with it. So, you know, every case is individual, you know, I'll give you the disclaimer, but, you know, if the shots work good enough, don't have surgery, but your biggest danger is you get a heart problem or a kidney problem or something else. And now suddenly, wow, maybe joint replacement's not a good option for you because of other medical problems. Okay. Way in the back. Uh, how often do you do a, uh, a hip replacement? I never do that, nor would I. Um, I, I know at Mayo, there was a guy who would do those a few times at the same setting. Okay. Frequently I'll have somebody have a joint replaced and six, 12 weeks later, they'll go have another joint replaced. Typically you want to do the hip before the knee because hip pain can frequently refer to the knee and you may take away a lot of that knee pain fixing the hip, even if the knee's arthritic. And I don't believe that same setting uh, two joints on one limb is a good idea. And, and so I wouldn't do it. I, I think you could find people that would do it, but I still don't think it's a good idea. I do do two knees at one time for the select person, and that's a long discussion in the clinic for me and the patient. Um, it can be a good answer. Uh, but simultaneous uh, bilateral knees, i.e. two people working on you at once, both hips at the same setting, or a hip and knee concurrently, uh, I don't believe is a, the best way to do things. I think there's more risk than benefit. Let's go in the back there. Is there any risk that you'll lose too much bone uh, living with your arthritic joint to not have a successful replacement? Uh, my answer would be no, because I think I can rebuild any worn out joint uh, that is a native joint. I think you could wait too long with an artificial joint to be able to fix it, you know, if the artificial joint were out. But with your native joint, uh, I don't think you can make it so worn out that it can't be fixed and fixed well. The things that I worry about not getting it as good would be if you had a large amount of deformity, and by large I mean like over 20 degrees of a varus or a vangle, varus valgus angle of your knee, or if you had a, a very limited motion, if you were you know a 30, 40 degree arc of motion of your knee, those are harder to get better. And so if you were losing that much motion and therapy couldn't keep it moving for you ahead of time and the pain wasn't so bad, I still might direct that type of person towards um, joint replacement earlier rather than waiting for them to say the pain's bad enough because it's the function part you're describing there that's getting bad. But bone loss in a primary joint replacement, we're pretty good at being able to rebuild that. Yeah, is there a follow-up to that? So do we ever do partial knee replacements and what are the activity restrictions after uh, knee replacement? So I think partial knee replacements for a very narrow subset of knee arthritic patients can be a good option. Uh, I actually don't do many of those because the number that come around that I think fit right into that category where they're appropriate, I refer them to one of my partners because I don't see enough people that are a good candidate for that to stay good at that operation. I have somebody who's interested in it, so if we can pool those together, that'd be a discussion I'd have with the patient after I examine them and, and saw them. If I thought they'd be a candidate for that, here's another option for you. And about half the time, 
they're, he thinks they are too, because it's hard to sort that out. There's a lot of complex factors. We went from doing a lot of those to a few of those to a lot of those, and now fewer again, as we sort out which ones last and which ones come back painful and we have to convert to a knee replacement. Activity restriction after joint replacement is a very good question. We'd like you to not gain a lot of weight. We'd like you to not do running, jumping, cutting, twisting sports. We'd like you to not repetitively heavy lift over 50 pounds. Those would be the main things. Yeah, because those are the things that are going to wear them faster, and those are the things that are going to lead to early failure. Yeah, and you'll get different restrictions from different surgeons based on what they want you to hear, but I think those are pretty solid. You know, uh, social doubles tennis, okay. Singles tennis competitively, not okay. That's what I tend to tell people and try and get them onto a softer surface. Downhill skiing, ugh, makes me a little nervous. Uh, you've been skiing your whole life, you're cruising, you know the course, you know the runs. Yeah, don't go out there and pound the bumps. Take it slow. Is it high risk? Yeah, skiing's high risk anyway, but do I prefer you not do it? No, are you crazy to do it? Not in a controlled situation. Yeah, yes sir, up front. Yeah, is a, a shot an alternative because of other medical conditions and age is the question. And my answer would be yes. If the shots help, I think it could be a cover-up for it. Again, we got to look at the big picture. You know, a brittle diabetic, I'm going to be less likely to recommend a regular cortisone shot into because it will interfere with your blood sugar metabolism. But um, I think that's a perfect time for another opinion. If I see somebody who I'm worried about their age or their medical comorbidities to have a joint replacement, I might suggest another opinion. You know, get somebody who I respect who does a lot of joint replacements to look and and say, what do you think of the risks here? And not because I want to get rid of the patient, but because I want somebody else thinking about it. And, uh, and so I think that's a good time to say, hmm, maybe I should get another opinion about that. And, and that's a reasonable way to go. And our shots and answer is, uh, should we consider surgery here? If we consider it, you know, how much more are the risks here? And, and if you're talking to an orthopedic surgeon or your primary care physician, then those are two different discussions. And yet they need to be working together as a team for you. Yes, sir. Uh, theoretically, infinitely, but here's what happens. Every time you go through the skin, you've got more scarring and it's harder to get the wound to heal. Uh, every time you have to remove a part from the bone, which we don't always have to do. Remember, the knee has a plastic liner and the hip has a plastic socket. They're modular. They can be changed out like a retread. And so you don't have to necessarily remove uh, parts from the bone. Whether or not you lose bone, removing metal parts when you have to take them all out, whether or not there's been bone loss from the wear debris, those are the things that limit our ability to redo them. You know, I've done people for the fourth or fifth time before. Usually those are in trauma or infection cases. Those are very hard cases. It's for those reasons that we advise putting off young people as long as we can, not because we want them to suffer, but because we want them to have the best lifetime function of their joint. And depending on your ego, you realize that you eventually get to the point where you can't fix it and you don't want to be that situation when you do this kind of job. So you, you try and put it off as long as you can. Yes, ma'am. In the hip, yeah. Right. Yeah, we we're talking about cement and joint replacement. Do we use it? For hip replacements, there's still cement used to do the uh, thigh bone or, or femoral side in a much less case than it used to be. Uh, the reason is we find a better long term track record with uncemented prostheses. No, you, the, the bone's a hollow tube, and you fit something very snugly into it, and you drive it in. And then it's got a coating that the bone can grow to so it can integrate to the bone. And uh, there's different shapes. There's two main different shapes that work that way, but they have very good long-term track records. That, that loosening of the femoral component is not a common problem. Um, on knees, although the companies keep trying to sell parts that are uncemented because it'll be quicker or better, uh, the long-term track record for uncemented knees is not good. And so on knees, at Mercy, I don't think anybody's done an uncemented knee for a long time. I don't know anybody at the U doing uncemented knees, but I don't know all of them there now. They've got some new people. So on knees, I want cement on my knee. I want cement on all my patients' knee because 
Uh, loosening of those components is very uncommon or rare, and the cement there does not create a problem. And I also think the cement creates a little bit of a barrier to decrease the amount of bone loss we get from the wear debris. So I like cemented knees. Cement is, I'm going to just say something about cement. It's not really a glue, it's a grout. So when we lay uh, bricks, you got to stack them up very neatly and you fill in the little crack with the mortar. When we make uh, cuts for a knee replacement, we're talking about one millimeter, two millimeter increments at most. Uh, so you've got a very thin space between the bone. The bone's a honeycomb of uh, a little interstices that looks like a honeycomb. Uh, and that cement acts as a grout between those parts. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. It can exercise help arthritic joints. People with arthritis in their knee, if we take an x-ray and they have whatever grade, bone on bone or almost bone on bone, we break it out by different numbers. If we look at those people and we look at their activity level, guess who has more pain? Inactive people. So if you're active, you're likely to be thinner, more fit, stronger muscles. Those things all correlate directly with better function, less pain for your joint. So if you are worried with an arthritic joint that you're going to wear it out more, don't worry about staying active and keeping it moving. It's when you lose that function that you think about having something done to yourself for it. But you're, there's no good evidence that by doing regular exercises to keep the thigh muscles, the buttock muscles, the muscles around these joints strong in the shoulder, the, all the muscles around there, keeping them stronger will allow your arthritic joint to function better. That doesn't mean power lifting or strenuous sports, but gen, general conditioning of those joints, critical to stay away from joint replacement. When you come to it, you'll do better with it you'll recover faster and you'll have a better outcome. So you're not gonna hurt it that way. And I think it's a good way to put off the need for it and improve the success of it afterwards. Way in back. Yeah, so bilateral knee replacements, um, there's, well, there's the economic concern, which is why you hear a lot of places don't do them because you take a huge hit as a hospital and a physician to do them. Uh, they basically, I don't, I don't know if the hospital can break even on doing it. And uh, as a physician, you're taking a big financial hit. So you'll find a lot of places that just say, we don't do them, okay? So when you shop around, which you should do for something big like this, there's that unspoken rule, okay? For those of us who don't make every decision based on Monday, money, like my group and my hospital, then you gotta look at the real reasons, which are safety, okay? Outcomes, are we gonna do better with two? So if I have a younger, more healthy patient who is highly motivated to do their rehab, because it's not like having one and one is two. It's like having one and one is like three or four operations on you. Twice the blood loss, twice the anesthesia time. And I can do these efficiently. You know, I can do a knee replacement in 45 minutes to an hour, so I can do the other one just as fast. But it's still twice the blood loss, twice the anesthesia, twice the rehab. And if you don't have good upper body strength, I think that slows you down being able to get up. I think if you're very heavy, we put a lot of stress on our wounds early on. If you have a lot of deformity, it's an advantage. So there's a myriad of factors that go into that discussion. And it really comes down to the person being highly motivated to do it and not having other pulmonary and cardiac problems specifically, which would lead me to steer them away for that. Yes, ma'am. This was going to be a treatment for the knee? Yeah. It was oh, okay. Uh -huh. It would, as a very last resort, scrape bone on both sides. Hmm. Now, versus which a knee replacement be better than having to go through that? Type of okay, so if we're talking about, the question is, is a treatment for bone-on-bone -bone knee arthritis, uh, would scraping the bones be beneficial? Um, I see a lot of people who have had their knees cleaned out or scraped, usually arthroscopically, uh, who felt that their knee is no better or worse, and why did I have this done, and what are my options? And their option is knee replacement usually, okay? So uh, that's another question that leads me to say, you know, would need to see your x-rays or other medical conditions, but that sounds like I want another opinion there. Um, I, I'm not, I, I, there's not much to be gained by scraping your bone. In small focal areas to go in and pick at the bone to get cartilage to grow up out of it, which is really just scar tissue, 
maybe that can be helpful, but it better be a pretty small area and you better be prepared to stay off of it for six weeks. So that sounds like uh, I need to see the x-rays and do that and get more opinions because I, I agree that doesn't seem to be a, a treatment that I would jump to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For the most part, I've been on long-term NSAIDs for years mm-hmm. because of this, okay, which is fine. Mm-hmm. But on occasions, up and down stairs, uh, the knees, they, I mean, they, they hurt. They're swollen, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whatever. And the Relaphone does help, I will say that. But would it be to my advantage just to put off, like, maybe considering a joint replacement? How old are you? Yeah. So at 59, you're getting to the point where we're getting less nervous about how long you're going to live and how high you're going to function because you're going to slow down. We all are going to. And uh, and I can't repeat that question. Sorry. And I think that you're in that difficult stage that I've tried to address. OK, you know, how ba- how often are those days really bad? How much do you have to do stairs? Does the laundry have to be in the basement? Can it be moved to the ground floor? You know, these are all the other things that we can do. But then it's like, oh, have I tried shots? Have I done this? Okay. And then, you know, if, if they're talking about scraping or other treatments that you're mm, not sure about, that I'm not sure about, I think you'd talk to another doctor and get a fresh perspective on it and look at somebody else. You know, I, I, I don't want to get rid of patients, but I think second opinions are great things because sometimes people aren't just going to hear what I say. It's just not going to make sense to them. And somebody else is going to say something that clicks. And they may come back to me and ask that question, and great, now I just failed to explain it. But I think that, uh, that, that that is where you struggle. So you talk to your family and your friends, and you say, ooh, maybe we get another look at this. Yeah. Back there. Um, how would history of cancer treatment affect mm-hmm. the cannabis issue joint replacement? Right. Well, it would really depend on how long ago the can- – how would the history of cancer treatment affect uh, joint replacement? Um, real common for me to see nowadays – uh, especially in women because of breast cancer's prevalence and the success at detecting and treating it. So, so much, so many people are surviving it. Too broad a question to answer specifically. Specific things would include, though, chemotherapy. Are there side effects that we need to watch for? Is there an increased risk of blood clots based on the, um, on the history of cancer that would necessitate us altering our protection we use against blood clots? Was there any radiation in the area? Are there any scars in the area that we need to treat? And, uh, and so it, it's, it's like a heart history or a lung history, just as important as a cancer history, could affect it a little bit on how it's done. By no means makes me, quote, scared to do that joint replacement. In most cases, I think would be unlikely to increase your risks of the joint replacement. Yes, sir. Uh, my right knee gives me quite a bit of trouble. My left knee, knee does. Mm-hmm. Assisted devices are great. Canes and walkers will keep you moving a long time. It can take 30% off of an affected hip or knee if you use it right. Uh, Sometimes you need to go to a therapist to learn how to walk with it, to touch it down so that you get the best benefit from it. And so if that could keep you from having a knee replacement at 83, I'd do it all day before I'd have surgery. Yeah. Let's go in the back. Uh, if you have a joint replacement in, they have changed the recommendations like every few years for my entire career. And at Steinler, we're actually sitting down and going to say, all right, we have to review this again to try and come up with a new global recommendation. My current recommendation, and I may change this in the next six months, honestly, is that if I had a joint replacement, I would take one dose of amoxicillin if you're not allergic, one half hour before I had an invasive procedure like a teeth cleaning for the rest of my life. But the problem I have is I'm the guy they call when it's infected. I have a lot of partners that don't do revision, resection, arthroplasties, and reconstruct the infected one. So that's a year out of somebody's life with me and them spending a lot of time together. So I have a very biased view of that because I'm the guy taking care of it. And so I want to do everything I can to prevent those because I've seen a few of them in my career. And I think that cost and downside of that antibiotic is low enough that that would be what I would do. There are recommendations out there that say after a year or two, you don't need to do that. But then there's a bunch of caveats. You're immunosuppressed. Well, is type 2 diabetes immunosuppressed, or does it have to be type 1? And then they argue. So there's a gray zone in there. There's no doubt about it. Yes, sir. The gentleman with 83 over here Mm -hmm. moved his age back to 73 and had the same question. How would you answer that? (laughs) Okay.
okay, what's your general health and how much does it really bother you? Because if you can do everything you want to do and your knee is a little sore and you can get a shot every now and then, a couple times a year, and you use a cane when you really want to exercise and it's not keeping you from what you want to do, then I'm not going to race to have a knee replacement because you got life expectancy 10, 12 years at 72, 73. But I wouldn't sit there and suffer with it because, again, your knee replacement is likely going to last you a lifetime. And then the next question is, is what do you got coming up in the next six to 12 months? Do you have a trip this and a wedding there and a, another event here that you got to be up for? Because that's not the time to replace your knee. But if, wow, you know what? We just got the grandkids stuff done. Nobody's graduating this year. I see the opportunity to take time for me to get my knee fixed and devote all my time to my rehab and not be worried about taking care of my husband or my wife or getting to the grad kids things, then take the time for yourself and do that. Because when you make that decision, you got to get a little greedy. And especially women don't want to do that. They want to take care of everybody else first, but you got to be a little greedy and take care of yourself when you get to this point. And it's important to put yourself first to get better on this. And that's something that people don't always do. And I should have said it as part of my talk, but you, when you make the decision and you move forward with it, then commit. And be dedicated because, again, you've got to follow directions. you got to be persistent. I have gone to telling people there will be a time after your joint replacement in the first few days or weeks where you will regret doing this. You'll say, why did I do this? I'm worse than I was before. That's perfectly normal. Don't think you're crazy. A lot of my patients honestly tell me they have it, and they're still very happy with their joint replacement down the road. So when you make the decision to do it, it's not like you're going to bluff and fold the hand. When you're in, you're in. We can't take the old knee out and put the – uh, we can't take the new knee out and put the old one back in. So be committed to get it better. Be selfish. Take the time it needs. And don't be distracted by, oh, that trip or, you know, this kid's activity level. Be selfish and take care of yourself first. Good. Question in the back there. Pain, swelling. I don't know, you might feel a bump or a swelling around your knee. I think that'd be the main things. And a lot of times you wouldn't feel anything at all. That's, that's the importance of the x-ray. Yes? Uh, there seems to be two kinds of glucosamine. There's chromatin and sulfate. Yeah. And my husband, his orthopedic doctor, told him to take the sulfate. So what's yeah. the difference? What do you recommend? I don't know the difference. I've had that question before. I've directed people to the pharmacist. Whenever I've seen a study that looks at the comparison, it's with the sulfate. And so that's the one that I feel more comfortable recommending, but I can't tell you there's an advantage of one over the other. I have a pharmacist friend, and he has a hard time explaining it to me. There's something about how they compound it. Should you keep on taking that after surgery? Now, my husband's had a shoulder mm -hmm. and hip replacement. He's been for years. Um, I would trial without it and see how he feels. Uh, I'm not sure how many joints are left there to really uh, protect. <laughs> Sounds like one hip. And... Uh, I'm not so sure that it would be helping that much. Uh, you might be able to save a couple dollars a month, but, but truthfully, when you do stop it, you know, see how he feels because if that other hip sore or if in general his joints are bothering him, he's not hurting himself taking it, obviously. But I'm not sure that after the, yeah, he's almost got six. That's the record, six. I've never seen many more. He's right there on the edge. All right, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. What I'm suggesting is that you don't just sit. Okay. So to get out and walk, to keep your weight under control, to be using your leg muscles are what's important. And with a bad hip, you're not damaging your hip further. So it can't be fixed. And generally people with a bad hip who get some regular exercise will feel better. Wow. I just can't do it anymore. I mean, it's just too sore. And we should be talking about fixing your hip. We should be talking about replacing it because if you can't do some general walking each day to keep yourself fit and healthy, then it, that's an indication for surgery, all right? However, I think that what I'm talking about in terms of physical therapy to help ahead of time, there's some specific exercises that you can do to keep the muscles about the hip strong. The hip and the back are very much linked together. It's very hard to sort out hip from back problems a lot of times in the clinic for me. And so strengthening the core muscles, stretching for the lower back, and keeping the hip muscles stronger, I think a therapist is very helpful at sorting that out too. I see a lot of patients who were sent to the therapist for their back, a lot of chiropractors 
who see patients for their back and go, this is not your back. This is your arthritic hip. And they get directed to me for their hip problem. And that's, that's where I think it, that they can be helpful. Okay. I had back surgery mm-hmm. in October. Mm-hmm. Sure. But now I think maybe my back hurts now more because my hip is causing me problems so I can't walk, which is what I really want to be able to do. Yeah. So then the question is, can I just keep trying? Yes. Even though it hurts? <laughs> you can keep trying. I don't think you're going to hurt yourself to try to exercise through that. But if you just can't do it and it's miserable... Often back surgeons don't take care of hips. You may need another doctor to look at it. Yeah. And they usually can recommend one for you. Yeah. Okay. Up down front. Um, if you have been diagnosed with bone on bone, mm-hmm. what age is too early and what age is okay now we're... Yeah. Well, okay, I'd like to see it like over 60 would be like, okay. Um, what's too young? We probably don't know the answer to that. I'm not going to do teenager okay. joint replacements, but they're done. Okay, that's like, you know, the one in the million. Um, you know, I think when you get to your 40s uh, and you're miserable and it's really hurting, we start to think about it, but boy, I try not to do it. I really try not to do it. In our 50s now, it's becoming more widespread and accepted but I try and hold to my guns of trying to put those people off as best I can too. And it's usually a few visits and conservative therapy as we get to see how it's really affecting your life that I need to learn more about that young 50 year old to help them and see how they're doing. So, you know, in your mind, you know, we're all trying to hold off into our sixties. Okay. But we never make that. And I replace a lot of people that are younger than that's joints. And that that's, I think you need to, de- if you're that young with that bad a problem, I think you need to develop a relationship with your orthopedist so they can see how it's affecting your life and be exhausting conservative measures. And so that you can reach that decision together. Way in back. Are there uh, additional complications in joint replacement with younger patients? Um, My experience with younger patients is they're harder to make happy. They want to do more. Um, That's where the marketing has really come in saying, oh, we're going to make your life perfect again by replacing your joint. It's really easy for me to get the 83-year-old gentleman's knee happy because he does not expect to do what he did 30 years ago. There's the real issue. And so, well, I want to play tennis, I want to run, and I want to crawl around in the garden, I want to kneel on hard surfaces. You know, I can't promise you can kneel on a knee replacement. I wouldn't keep you from doing it, but it's sore sometimes, and sometimes it's too sore that people can do it. And so it's hard to satisfy that young patient. In terms of complications, I actually see less short-term complications because medically they tend to be healthier. I mean, I don't take care of people with BMIs that are off the chart. I don't think they should have surgery. So in general, um, those patients generally are healthier than older patients and have less of the medical and other complications we can see around it. But longer term, it's the complications I'm worried about with the young patient, the wear or the loosening of the parts because of their activity level. They're out doing things more. But I don't think they're more at risk for scar tissue and other problems that way. It's more that previous surgeries or injuries and other comorbidities that can affect those types of things. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Are we in trouble yet? Are we okay time-wise? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, part of our protocol at Mercy is we have everybody see a therapist beforehand. We tend to do that really close to surgery, but I certainly see a large number of patients who say, you know, I'm not going to do this till next fall or next year or sometime, and I, I want to know how I can get ready. And we'll send them to see a therapist to learn those exercises. And yes, they're very similar. They focus on stretching, quadricep strengthening, hamstring strengthening. Um, yes, they're very similar. All right. If, if you folks don't have other questions, I'll just say thank you for coming and listening to me today. It's obviously what I like to do, take care of joint replacements. And uh, if I can help you in the future, give me a call out Steiner. Otherwise, uh, maybe we'll get some spring in Iowa this weekend. Dr. Scott, thank you so much for sharing your expertise this morning. That was a great presentation. And I can tell there's a high level of interest here from all of your questions. Uh, 
Doug, could you bring up the basket? Let me tell you one quick thing about Mercy, uh, and that is that for a couple of years, we've been going through a renovation of all of our inpatient rooms. And uh, this includes our orthopedic unit. Uh, by 2016, we will have all renovated uh, single patient rooms. And we think this will be a big improvement for our patient care. Like I said, that'll be complete by 2016 and uh, will be especially uh, improvement to our orthopedic unit. Thank you again so much for coming. Thank you. Watching City Channel 4. On TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.